Welcome, guys. Thank Hello. You. Hi, there, guys. We're uh, really excited to, to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first time. Uh, cool. All right, so what do you have in store for us today? Oh, well, we're going to talk about uh, probably uh, one of the coolest technologies uh, Microsoft have been working on at the moment, which is a blazer, like you were saying. So it's really, really exciting. And uh, uh, even though it's uh, something which is still relatively new, uh, it, it's becoming more and more mature pretty much on a weekly basis. So, yeah, it's super cool. I, I hope that the, the audience will, uh, will enjoy, will have our excitement as well. Yeah, definitely. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, before I uh, yeah, give you the floor, uh, I'm just going to say one thing, uh, probably you as well, but everybody loves, uh, every speaker loves questions. So we have a Q&A uh, uh, mm -hmm. chat in Teams. So feel free to ask uh, all the questions there. And uh, at the end of each session, we're going to uh, yeah, tackle them and uh, try to answer them. Am I allowed to do so as well? Sure, if you insist. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I need to finish the, the quiz. So. All right. All right. Shall Let's I enjoy the day then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Marco, much. You want to share the screen? Good. Look, okay, I hope you guys can see my screen. So uh, thank you for, uh, for being here in uh, uh, this talk at CodeCamp. I'm really sorry. We couldn't meet in person this year, but hopefully next year will be better. Um, my name is Marco. I am a, a DevTech uh, MVP. I've been an MVP for the last uh, 11 years. And uh, I'm with uh, Kristen today. Kristen, say something about yourself. Hello. Hello, everybody. I am Kristen. I, I've been working with .NET the, since the first release. So I worked with all the related technology, Azure, with HP.NET. And my list is special now is, is Blazor. So I'm Microsoft MVP since 2004. So yes, I'm an old guy. And uh, look, Marco, and you? Yeah, it looks like uh, you're older than me, but actually you're not. So <laughs> yeah, cool. And uh, guys, as I, as I was saying, we're going to talk about probably uh, one of the most cool technologies Microsoft has been working on uh, today, which is Blazor. And uh, we're going to do it um, showing you how you can build a progressive web application that uses Blazor on the front end and uh, Azure Functions on the back end. So super really cool stuff, guys. Stay tuned. Um, just one, one little thing. Um, if you're not acquainted with Blazor, you haven't had the chance to, uh, to use it yet, don't worry. We'll try to, to keep things simple, but I'm pretty sure that even those of you who are a bit more experienced with that will have something new to learn uh, through this session, hopefully. So uh, let's see how, how it unfolds. So what is the agenda for today? Um, today, guys, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to use this uh, sample application to show you uh, some of the features uh, we can use when, when building a uh, progressive web application. So this is basically, uh, this is a, a, like an order shop, um, an online shop in which you can order food and uh, it's gonna be, uh, okay, I know it looks ugly, but uh, I'm a developer, I'm not a designer, sorry about that. Um, and uh, it's gonna be basically uh, both either a web application or a progressive web application, so something you can install on your uh, on your desktop machine or your device as well. And uh, it's going to be completely serverless. So for the authentication, we're going to use uh, Azure Active Directory uh, B2C. Um, for uh, the backend, the backend is entirely built in uh, uh, built in Azure Functions, so full serverless. Even the database is a uh, uh, is a serverless a SQL database, okay? And uh, uh, as any other uh, progressive web application, we will see how we can, uh, uh, what we need to do in order to uh, support the offline mode, okay? Which is uh, which is important, especially if uh, someone is installing it on uh, his device and you know that devices cannot rely 100% on their connectivity. And uh, the last thing, unfortunately, given the amount of time that we have today, I'm not sure uh, I'll be able to show you is how to implement uh, the card by, uh, via durable entities, which is one of the, fun fun one of the features of, uh, of Azure Functions. But uh, anyway, the code will be available for you. It's available straight away. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to go and have a look at it. Uh, 
Yeah, this is a, a very an extremely demo based talk. I always, uh, I and Christian always love to do this very, very uh, practical talks. So this is pretty much the, the only slide that we have. We have another one for the thank you. So let's uh, mm -hmm. uh, head to Vision Studio and, uh, and start looking at the code. Well, actually, before going to Visual Studio, let's have a look at the application uh, in Internet. Um, so this is uh, already hosted uh, hosted in Azure, and uh, uh, the way it works is that I can uh, go to my catalog page, for example, um, and here I can uh, authenticate in my application. As you can see, as I said, it's uh, uh, Active Directory B2C prompting me for the uh, for the for my credentials, and I can sign up or sign in already. Uh, once I sign in, the tool recognizes me uh, here. Uh, it will take a second to load the um, the catalog, and this is because, uh, 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 as I said, the the database is serverless. So this is really useful for development purposes uh, when uh, you don't want you only want to pay for uh, for the database when, uh, for when you use it. But once the catalog is uh, is loaded, like in this case, I can uh, just uh, click on the items and. Uh, um, again, one of the drawbacks of this being serverless is that there's a there's a little wake up time once you interact with the uh, with the features. And uh, uh, as you can see, the catalog, uh, the the cart, sorry, gets populated. I can proceed with my order, and uh, uh, and once this is done, there will be something else uh, which we'll see later on during the talk, uh, receiving that order and being able to to process it. So this is the big picture. Uh, let's have a look at the solution in Visual Studio one sec. So. Uh, the solution is, uh, is basically made of uh, uh, four projects, all right? We have uh, a backend project, uh, a receiver project. We, this one will be a bit more clear later on during the talk. A UI project, uh, this is the Blazor WebAssembly application and, uh, the, uh, and the shared library. So what is a Blazor WebAssembly for those of you who have not um, had the chance to uh, to use it or to look into it. So it's a, a it's a new technology to build uh, uh, single page web applications. Um, the which is using the WebAssembly W3C standard. And uh, what the WebAssembly W3C standard allows me is uh, to basically run my applications, uh, my C sharp code, sorry, into the browser. So my C sharp code gets compiled uh, in a, in an assembly, and then when I load uh, the website. The website uh, is uh, capable of uh, uh, the, the browser is capable of running those DLLs. Obviously, uh, yeah, the, I, I can almost see in some one of you raising your eyebrows. Or well, what does it mean? I'm running a DLL into the browser. Is this the new ActiveX? Uh, can they do uh, go to uh, my C uh, um, hard drive and look at my stuff? No, obviously this is not possible. Uh, the WebAssembly code runs in a sandbox, which is uh, pretty much the same. It's even more restrictive than uh, than the sandbox where the JavaScript code runs, right? But apart from that, uh, the good thing about it is that you can uh, again you can uh, you can use your C# -sharp code, your syntax that you are very very acquainted with, and even your libraries uh, can be uh, used either in the browser or in the backend. And an, an example of this is this shared library here, in which I have, for example, I have my product object, all right? And this product object is uh, consumed by my um, UI code, right? So this UI code is using a product by this shared library, but it's also the same the same object which, which is a uh, which is consumed by the um, the API code, all right? So this is a uh, this is quite useful to make sure that the UI Keeps being aligned over time with uh, uh, with the backend in terms of the object model that they're sharing. And uh, if you guys have been using, uh, um, I don't know, uh, single page tool uh, frameworks such as Angular or or React, which are based on JavaScript, you know how painful can it be sometimes to to make sure that that, that the the two words uh, remain aligned over time. Um, Let's have a, another a quick look at uh, the syntax which I can use in Blazor to uh, to create my pages. So, for example, if I go to my pages folder here and I look at my catalog page, this one is a is the page we just saw in which there are there's a, the pizza, the pasta, and etc. Um, I bet that you guys, if you if you've been working with ASP.NET MVC in the past 15 years, 
uh, you probably recognize this syntax. So this is the plain old Razor syntax, which is a, a very elegant way to mix uh, C sharp code with uh, with markup, right? But again, there's a there's a, a substantial difference with uh, what was happening with with MVC in this case with Blazor. It's the browser processing this page and uh, rendering it in HTML. There's no server involved. Uh, in fact, when we build this Blazor application, what we obtain is basically just a static website, which can be hosted in any um, server which is capable of, uh, of serving uh, um, just files, right? So even uh, Azure storage uh, works well for that. And uh, as you can see, um, I don't want to go very much into the detail, but here I'm using my async await syntax. I'm calling my product service, get product async, and this will return me an array of products. Okay, the uh, the class that we just saw, and then when uh, these products uh, have been populated, I just uh, iterate over the uh, over the collection, and uh, I render the individual uh, product items. Okay, so there's uh, this syntax which is based on. Uh, uh, it's component based, but uh, so I can create my custom components and uh, reuse them uh, all over my application. Okay. Um, if I have if I have a look at the get products async method here, uh, as you can see, this class product service is using my plain uh, old HTTP client class to make the uh, to make a call to the backend. But again, don't be fooled. In this in this case, when I trigger this get from JSON async method, what will happen is that actually the browser will do an, an XML HTTP request to uh, to the server. All right. So even though I'm using HTTP client, this is not a, which might smell like a server to server call. Uh, this is actually not a server to server call. It's actually using mm, uh, it's using the browser capabilities. OK, cool. Um, if we go and have a look at the uh, at the calls that the application is making under the hood, uh, let me try to refresh that. Um, oh, and as you can see, there's a, there are a bunch of DLLs that are loaded when uh, when I refresh my uh, my page. All these DLLs are cached, so uh, it's pretty fast after the first time. But again, it's your actual framework running on the browser, all right? Um, so if we have a look at the at the call to to products, all right, and we try to reproduce this um, just by calling it in this way, as you can see, this is a uh, this is erroring because uh, because the uh, the API is actually protected. Uh, you can't see it from the uh, from the code, but if I go in Azure and uh, I look at the uh, Azure function settings in uh, in Azure Functions, as you can see, I've uh, activated my authentication here, and I'm saying that I, it, the calls need to be authenticated by uh, Azure Active Directory. And uh, so this makes sure that only authorized callers can uh, can actually invoke my uh, my endpoint. So how does it work? How do we secure this uh, uh, both the, the UI and uh, and the backend? Um, well, it turns out that it's pretty simple. The first step I need to do is. Uh, uh, in case I'm using Azure AD B2C, is a uh, it's going here uh, and uh, register an application. I'm not going to do, to uh, to explain all the tiny details of this uh, because there's plenty. There are, there's literally plenty of documentation in the, in Microsoft Code for that. But I just want to give you an idea on uh, on how this works. So I'm going to create uh, my my application. For example, Blazor sample here and. Uh, what I'm saying is that what, what I need to, to get out of this is the application client ID. All right, so there, there are a few ingredients that I need to receive. So one is the client ID. Uh, let me just uh, mark it a little bit here. So this is the client ID. And then the other thing I need to, uh, once I've created the application, another thing I need is uh, the domain of uh, my Azure Active Directory B2C instance, which is this one, okay, blazorb2c.onmicrosoft.com. I'm getting this uh, second ingredient. The last thing I need in case of B2C is uh, defining uh, one or more user flows, all right? Um, what is a user flow? A user flow is a configuration for an interaction with the user uh, between the user and the Azure AD, right? So in this case, for example, I've configured a user flow for uh, uh, for the user to be to be able to sign up or sign in. 
and there's a there's another one to reset the password and one to access uh, uh, the profile. OK, so once I have uh, all these ingredients, all I have to do, and this is why I'm saying that it's pretty super simple. All I have to do is uh, going on to Visual Studio and say, look, I want to create a new project. Uh, which is a, a Blazor application, right? And uh, and then when I select the Blazor WebAssembly, I can configure my authentication to use a. Uh, okay, this is the old version, but in the new version, you have the option to um, uh, to 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 fill this uh, um, to uh, to fill a wizard that, with uh, with all these parameters that we retrieved. Alternatively, you can use uh, the uh, .NET CLI uh, to do uh, to do pretty much the same thing. So if I go to um, uh, if I open my terminal and uh, I do .NET uh, new uh, webasm uh, project, I can uh, I can specify the parameters here for the uh, for the authentication. I think if I do minus H, I should be should be able to see the parameters. I'm not sure. Anyway. Uh, Yeah, this is probably going to, to mess up with it. Uh, let's uh, let, uh, we will. Uh, uh, but basically, in the, in the help, there are all the parameters that uh, all the all the um, parameters that you have to fill in order to create the, the application automatically. And what this um, uh, produces is basically a configuration file that goes on to the www root folder here, like this one. OK. Which contains basically uh, my the parameters that we we've just seen. As you can see, the authority is a, a combination between my domain and the sign up and sign in uh, user flow that I've configured. All right, and uh, these parameters are consumed by my program class, which is the startup class for Blazor. And uh, this program class, as you can see, is configuring here the MSIL authentication using this these parameters here and the, the, the basic template already contains all the components I need to do the login logout etc so it's uh, it's very very um, so it's very ready to go once you do it and then in order to say that for example I can only access my catalog once I'm authenticated I just needed to put my authorized attribute here and the routing of Blazor will, will see that there is this authorized attribute and only and require you um, to be authenticated in order to uh, to access this page. OK, the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, that when I made the call to. Um, to this API products. If we scroll a bit little bit down and let me zoom in here, as you can see, we have uh, we have a, a bearer token added in the authorization header during the call, and this is what allows me to make make that call successfully rather than getting this error here if I try to call it directly. And uh, how does it work? How because uh, because we we don't have any code uh, when uh, when we call the um, when we make this call that actually embeds that header. Well, this is another cool thing about uh, about Blazor um, that uh, contains a definition for uh, contains an object called authorization message handler that deals with this detail for us. How does it work? As you can see here, I am uh, registering in the IOC container an HTTP client. OK, this is using the uh, old, uh, the, the very well known HTTP client factory in uh, uh, in .NET. And uh, I'm registering. I'm, I'm calling it uh, API, and I'm pointing to the uh, URL of my of my API, and then I'm adding this authorization message handler, which is configured in this way. So what I'm saying is, uh, every time there is a, a call made to this URL here, okay, uh, this one, which is a uh, my API one, make sure that you embed a token with this scope here. And this is uh, uh, basically the application that protects my API on uh, Azure Active Directory. And uh, uh, the system will automatically try to acquire an access token for us. And if it's successful, it will add it to the authorization header in my request. So long story short, I don't have to deal with any of those details. And uh, as you can see from, uh, from the call here, um, 
everything would be done uh, by by Blazor automatically for me. OK, cool. So we we were able to make this call. OK, we can consume. We can uh, place orders uh, live on the website, but actually this is still running as a plain old website. I need the browser. Um, so how can we install it and uh, transform it in a progressive web application and install it in my desktop machine? Christian, can you shed some light on this? Yes, of course. Let me share the screen before first. OK, you maybe you already received it. You see it? OK, yeah. install, implement the progressive web application means that the user can install the application uh, on uh, the devices, mobile devices and desktop applications. So as you can see, we have a desktop icon here. And when you launch your application, you have a, a special Windows for that. It's something implemented by uh, the browsers, but now nowadays all the browsers support uh, all the browsers support progressive web application. Uh, in order to implement this feature, uh, we have to provide. There are two requirements. We have to provide two special files, uh, but don't worry because uh, Microsoft already implemented that. Uh, we, using a, a template, when we use the Valesio well, Web well, Assembly app a template, we have a, a special flag here, uh, progressive web application. If we flag this option, um, the template create a normal Blazor application uh, with Web Assembly support uh, and so on. But uh, moreover, we also have uh, two, two special files. Uh, one is the both are located inside the W root folder. The first one is manifest.json. This file contains, let me zoom it, okay, contains uh, the description of our application. So what is the name, the short name used inside the shortcuts, uh, what is the what is the software page since we are using the index.html page, uh, the start URL is the root and the color to use for the Chrome and the icons to use uh, in order to have uh, uh, this uh, beautiful shortcut. So uh, this is not related to Microsoft, it's a web standard, so we have to provide this file and you, we can change uh, this, uh, this file as we prefer. The other file uh, we need is the serviceworker.js. Uh, this is a, JavaScript, a special JavaScript file uh, because uh, it, it, it runs in background. So the browser, when our application starts, also loads these JavaScript files. And here we can implement all the progressive web app logics. And these files is linked inside our index.html. So you can see the link for the manifest and you can see here the registration of the service worker. So uh, this, this is what the um, template provides. As you can see here, the, the, the service work implementation is empty. Uh, this is because uh, when we develop, when we develop, we don't want any uh, progressive web app uh, feature implemented. Uh, so we don't want cache, uh, and we want to be sure that if, uh, if we made any change, to our code, we want to be sure that the browser runs always the latest. In fact, here there is another file called serviceworker.publish. Here uh, there are more, a lot of more, a lot of code. Uh, the, the implementation is based on the cache first strategy. The idea of Microsoft is to um, cache the resources used by our application when the user installs the application. So here the code intercepts two main events, which is the install phase, the activation, so when the user uh, starts our uh, application uh, after the installation, and the fetch phase. So the idea is to override the normal fetch operation, which goes directly uh, to the network, and provide uh, an offline version if, if available. So um, when the user installs the application, here, the idea is to uh, collect uh, all the assets available uh, used by our application, filtered by a special, uh, a special array. The idea here is uh, here is to filter by what are the extensions we want to cache, what are the files or extensions we don't want to cache. For example, the service worker is not cached, but all the other assets like ELS, 
uh, WebAssembly, JavaScript files, and so on are, are cached. And uh, every time the user try to navigate uh, to a resource, they, they, they to resource and navigate means uh, load also when the user try to load an images, uh, an image or to load uh, an HTML page. The idea is to try to go to the cache and uh, if available, it returns the cache. If not, he try to load directly from the normal fetch operation. So the, the browser try to load directly from the network. So uh, there is an important thing to, to note here it is that we can choose when the user get a, an offline version, a cached version, or if the browser try to go directly to, to, the, to the remote resource. Here, there is another important thing, uh, which is uh, this uh, special variable, access manifest, that is not defined here, but is defined outside in a, into another file called the service worker assets. Uh, this file is not available, as you can see, uh, is not, uh, not inside this folder, but if we build our application and we go into the object folder, let me go here, if I remember the exact uh, position, uh, should be static web assets. No, it's not. Um, it, it is. Server worker dot assets is a, a file generated by the compiler, like when Visual Studio compile our, uh, our solution. And the idea here, here is to provide a list, an array of uh, a, a tuple of uh, URL and the edge of this file. These two information are used by the service worker here um, in order to understand if the, if the assets is changed or not. So the idea is when the application starts, uh, when the application starts, the engine try to uh, provide directly the offline version, the cache version of this asset. But, but if uh, the asset has changed, uh, the background, the service worker tried to load uh, a new one, ver a new version directly from the remote resource, resource. So uh, this strategy means that the user doesn't always have the latest version of our application. Uh, we have to be sure that the APIs provided by Marco, Marco in this case, um, should consider that sometimes the user doesn't uh, run the latest version of our application. Okay, so since the, the network uh, is not reliable, the idea is to be sure to load directly from the cache version and uh, fall back to the network if uh, the, the offline version is not available. So if I run this application, thanks to the manifest file, we will see here at the top uh, the, the install button. So this experience depends by the browser. So here, for example, in Chrome, we have uh, this, this button. Uh, in the mobile devices, we have to add it to the home. For example, in iPhone, it depends by the device and by the, uh, the browser. If I press install, our application starts directly as a, 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 unique, a unique Windows. And here at the start menu, the start menu, we have the shortcuts to our application. So it's a pretty straightforward to implement a progressive web app. Uh, but it is not enough because if we go into our application, yeah, we have the, the Chrome, we have the, the menu, but what happens if our application doesn't have any connectivity? And as you can see here, uh, we have a label which shows the um, the connectivity status and online now I'm online but if I simulate to go offline as you can see the label now is red um, how would we have implemented this so let me go to the our, our application um, in order to implement this we have to use uh, some special uh, APIs provided by the browser by JavaScript by JavaScript and uh, Microsoft doesn't provide any um, APIs in order to do that, uh, to do uh, if, to, to connect, uh, to, to, to know the, connect, the connectivity status or to work uh, with uh, browser objects inside .NET. Now, the idea is quite simple. You have to interrupt with JavaScript in order to do some JavaScript-related stuff. 
So here we have implemented a few lines of code in order to um, uh, make a bridge between our .NET code and uh, the JavaScript world. There are two special events we can handle, which are online and offline events. Every time one of these are raised, uh, is raised, we call this on update on status function. And uh, since uh, we have the ability to call from JavaScript, we can call uh, .NET and vice versa. So from .NET, we can do call JavaScript. The idea is that when our application starts, we call the init function of JavaScript, which intercepts, uh, which intercepts the events. And every time something changes, um, we call we call back uh, .NET uh, uh, with the new status. So uh, using the online property, uh, the online field, we can tell to Blazor uh, which is the which is the new status. So now the the JavaScript part is over. Uh, all the stuff now are uh, is written in .NET. So we have created a class called Network Service. Which class is registered inside the dependency injection container here. Um, the, the idea is to provide this service inside all components that need this information, which are the, this information uh, mainly with if we are online or not, and provide an event, an event which tell if the online status change from offline uh, from offline to online. So the first stuff to do is to initialize the JavaScript function. So using the IJS runtime interface, we can call a JavaScript function. So uh, the Blazor Network init function here uh, is called uh, passing the, the reference. This special object, .NET object reference, allows uh, us to call .NET from JavaScript. We have created here a reference to our object. So uh, the reference we have here is directly connected to networks, uh, to our network service class. And uh, since here, when we invoke uh, .NET code, we are calling a function called uh, update online status. The update online status is, is a function here. Uh, the only requirement is to mark our function with a natural JS invocable. Here we are when we call update online status, we pass the only status, which is a boolean. So we receive the boolean, and what do we do? We simply call the event, we log it, and we change the online this online property. Now, when we have implemented the, this, this feature, we can go to the network service, uh, sorry, to the net menu. And at the top, we can use dependency injection in order to uh, receive the network interface instance. And when we need it here, we simply check if we are online or not, and we show the update the online status. Another requirement is to intercept when our component is initialized, we, we need to intercept online changed event because uh, we need to tell to measure engine to reinvalidate uh, this component. This made special method, still has changed, I'll, uh, allows us to, to tell to, to the measure engine to re render this component. And this allows uh, us to immediately change the label of, of our, uh, our net menu component. Okay, now, uh, now, as you can see, if I go offline and I try to go to catalog page, even if I'm offline, I can, as I can see the product list. How we have implemented it? Let me go back to um, the product service that Marco already showed to you. And uh, okay, Marco showed that we can simply call HTTP client in order to load products. But here we have we have done something more. We still use the network service class in order to check if we are online or not. If we are online, we try to go directly to, to, the, to the sources, to the resource, in order to be sure that we always have the latest one. But here we also do another thing. We use a local storage service. This interface is a, just a wrap to the local storage APIs provided by JavaScript. 
And this interface uh, uh, is implemented by this uh, Gate package, which is a, an open source project you can you find on GitHub and you can use it. Um, the, the, the idea is quite simple because thanks to this object, we can use uh, APIs like get or set or clear in order to add an item. This item can be any object because uh, this API serializes in, using JSON uh, our, 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 object, our object. So since our product is a simple uh, object, we can simply serialize it. So every time we load the products, it's stored. But if I am uh, if I am online offline, we can simply try to deserialize this item from the from the storage. So nothing is different from the point of view or of who are calling this method. If I go here, we can see indeed that inside the local storage we have a, a, a key for the for the sync with the old JSON realized inside uh, uh, my my venue. Okay, well, you can uh, alternatively use IndexNDB, there are a wrap or support that, but here is the simple way in order to, to cache our product list. So now, um, in order to add an item to, to the card, we have to be logged in. But since we are working offline, there are something to, to consider, right, Marco? Yes, exactly. Let me go back with my screen and very quickly, guys, I want to uh, show you what we need to do to support that. Um, so uh, we only have uh, probably another five minutes, so we, I'm, I'm going to be incredibly quick on this. So as we said, um, if I go to the catalog page, uh, there's this authorized attribute, which requires me to be authenticated. What does it mean for Blazor uh, to be authenticated? It means that um, if I look at the uh, at the content here that I have in my uh, in my uh, session storage, uh, exactly here, there is a, a token for me, okay, that represents my identity. Now these tokens expire over time, okay. After one hour, pretty much it's configurable, but they expire. And uh, what will happen is that automatically Blazor will try to revalidate that token with Azure Active Directory. But obviously, if I'm offline, this can't be done. And uh, uh, Therefore, we need to, to do something to make sure that our authentication state is preserved uh, even, uh, even after the token has expired if I'm offline. And how do we do that? Um, so in my programs.cs, I have created, uh, we have created a custom implementation for this account claims principle factory of remote user account. It's a nasty name, but what this class does is basically creating a claims principle out of the token that we just saw, okay? And the idea here is uh, to create a custom impl implementation of it, which is called offline accounts claim principle factory, okay? And this version of it will use a, a technique which is pretty similar to the one that we used in the, um, uh, in, uh, um, for the product service. So basically, if uh, I, I call the base implementation, so the base, the base class here and retrieve potentially a new claims principle claims principle for the logged in user. But then if that claims principle is authenticated, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, store it through this user service class into the local storage. Uh, I'm not going to open it, but basically internally user service uh, is a is a dictionary that stores the stuff in the local storage like we do uh, with the product service. OK, so that if uh, if the result is not authenticated because the token has expired and I'm offline, so only in that case, I can retrieve the user service from through the user service. I can retrieve the claims principle from the local storage. And this is basically what we're doing here. If we look at the local storage, as you can see, there's this user object that contains all the claims for the uh, for the logged in, uh, logged in user. OK, so this allows us to preserve the authentication state, even though we are offline and uh, the token has expired. Uh, now there's a uh, only the uh, I mean, uh, we need to make an order, Christian. So we need to interact with the cart. Yeah, exactly. So uh, when we press the add to cart, uh, the item see that it is uh, the cart, the cart viewer shows it. So shows it. So um, when we do that, uh, we uh, here we are. We have a button. The button call the function, and every code, all the code is is uh, 
uh, contained inside our car service. Here we are using uh, directly the cart object. This object is implemented by Marco. And uh, thank you, Marco, because I'm I'm lazy guy. So, uh, You're welcome. Uh, so the, the idea here that is that we are using the same logic, and we are sure that the logic implemented by Marco, for example, compute the this, the total amount of the items or or another logic is if I'm adding twice uh, the same product. Uh, the quantity is simply added instead of adding the same uh, cart item inside the cart. So um, first we are calling the the head on the dev method, and second we try to uh, synchronize, sorry, to save the item in the locker storage. Always to be sure that even I am offline, I can just add items uh, and proceed with the cart uh, even I'm, I'm offline. As you can see here, I have the pizza. But uh, moreover, it could be that I'm online. So the idea is to try to synchronize my cart online uh, if I'm online. Um, or maybe I'm not online. So the idea is that when I'm, I'm back online again, the idea is to try to synchronize the, the cart. So as you can see, uh, if I try to connect, uh, we will see that automatically our car try to synchronize using the APIs provided by Microsoft. And now my car uh, is uh, aligned. So the local version is the same on uh, of the online version. Moreover, since now I'm connected, you can see we have the, the order button available. This button is available only when uh, uh, I'm connected. So if I go to the car tuber, it's in the share here. Yeah. Um, you can see that this button uh, is uh, showed only when uh, it's your only when I'm connected. This method is required requires that the user should be online. So we always check that I'm connected and we call the dispatch method. What we are doing here, so we have to go back to the APIs provided by Microsoft inside the Our functions. Function. Yeah. And all the way to the bottom. Yeah, here we are. This special function, uh, in this special function, we use the, the card received uh, directly from the, from the JSON, but moreover, we are doing a special thing. We are using uh, um, an output binding called the service bus. Uh, this binding uh, allows, us, allows us to prove, to send our card directly to the bus. The idea is to add item inside the, the queue and some, somewhere, there is another engine or more instance of that engine that can decode the items and process the orders while there are, the user are sending this order. So there is another project called Order Receiver, receiver uh, that Marco mentioned before. And what we are doing here is to simply uh, monitor the queue using the service bus SDK provided by, by Microsoft. By Microsoft. So if I try to place the order, even in the, if even the console application, uh, the order receiver is uh, off. If I run the application, the bar, the service bus has collected the order. As you can see now, we printed all the order Microsoft Marco has done, before, and Christian and and I have done uh, a few seconds ago. So uh, pretty straightforward. Now, I see that we have a lot of questions. Uh, three questions we have. Marco, we can answer three. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Before, before we do that, let me just, uh, um, uh, let me just thank you, uh, the guys, for, uh, um, for their time listening to us. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk, even though it was uh, quite <laughs> relatively done uh, like uh, at warp speed. Um, Here's this link. Uh, here's the link where uh, the entire code base is. So even though we there were some things which we couldn't uh, really explain in detail, I'll just go there, grab the bits, and have a look. And feel free to contact us uh, if you have uh, uh, any any questions when you're looking at the code. Um, yes. So questions that we have uh, from the audience. Uh, Dan. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Marco, and thanks, Christian. Uh, I like the session a lot because it was interactive and then uh, I basically built something uh, in front of our eyes. 
Yeah. Um, we do have some questions, um, but before we dive into them, uh, I have one as well. As like, Whoa, uh, really? we could even really? say, we could even say we're. Uh, I know. I want to tackle the elephant uh, in the room because uh, I asked this yesterday to Dino as well. If uh, I talk to people about Blazor, I think I can uh, split them in two categories: uh, people that. Uh, uh, use it and they're excited uh, about uh, what it does and what it offers. Uh, they see that Microsoft is investing uh, heavily into this area. So, uh, uh, yeah, they're sort of uh, committed to it. But then there are also a group of people who said, yeah, it looks interesting, but I'm going to I'm going to wait a bit. What if it's uh, the new Silverlight? And by this, I mean, what if it will have the same fate as Silverlight? Yeah, so that's, a, that's a very interesting <laughs> point. Um, let me probably Christina also has something to add to that, but let me let me just point out a, a big difference with Silverlight. So Blazor is based on open standards, so it doesn't require a plugin. Uh, Silverlight was a gorgeous product in my opinion, right? But it uh, had the um, the problem of uh, uh, being released pretty much in a, that transition phase between the plugin world and <laughs> HTML5, HTML5 in uh, uh, in World Wide Web, and therefore that, that uh, at the end of the day harmed the success of uh, of Silverlight, and uh, Microsoft had to shift uh, their strategy. Um, but again, Blazor is a uh, is actually worked on. It's based on open standards. Uh, standards is a uh, by default supported by all the modern browsers. So I don't think there's a, a risk on that on that side, to be honest. Uh, Christina, do you agree? Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, I think the HTML and CSS are the future. So it doesn't matter which which framework you use. Uh, you can use Blazor in order to produce the same thing, or you can use uh, uh, Angular or React. Uh, so um, it's something not related to Microsoft. You know, uh, maybe there are some better framework that in the future could be more used more, but uh, from the point of view of the technology, Blazor uh, will be the future for, for Microsoft. If you are a net developer, I think uh, it's the right, the right tool uh, to, to choose. Or if you already know React and Angular, I can tell you to, to, to use Blazor uh, if you feel you are more confident with with such a tool. So, um, Marco, I, I, I think I'm, go I'm going to use Blazor uh, because uh, I, I trust this technology. Uh, yeah. Right, I think, yeah, I, I totally relate with this. Uh, so, uh, even if, yeah, over the years uh, I wrote some things in uh, JavaScript or in uh, Python, but at the end of the day, I'm a .NET developer and my go to language, if possible, in any service is uh, C Sharp. So if this allows me to use it, yeah, I'm going to uh, check this out. Uh, all right, uh, next, uh, there are some uh, specific questions uh, that are in the chat. Uh, let's see how many we can tackle and then you can uh, also uh, uh, write some answers uh, in the chat after the session. Um, one would be, uh, is it possible in the future to uh, compile ahead of time the application to web uh, assembly instead of running the .NET framework in the browser and the application on top of that. Yeah. But yes, so uh, this is something that uh, is in the backlog of the team. Uh, I think Christian that it's not going to be released. Sorry? May I expect to have it uh, in with .NET 6. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to be released with .NET 5. Um, just, but just beware of that it's a kind of a, a double-edged sword, right? Uh, because uh, on one end, yeah, definitely you don't have to do the just-in-time compile in the browser, right? Um, so, guys, uh, for for those of you who are not really acquainted with internals at the moment, uh, the WebAssembly part of Blazor is the runtime, right? By and uh, then uh, the DLLs that are downloaded in the browser are exact are the plain .NET Core DLLs. And then there's the runtime, which is a uh, um, compiling them just in time. Now, uh, pros and cons. If I do an ahead of time compilation, uh, obviously it means that uh, we can skip that part, so it's faster on that end. But at the same time, every website will have uh, their own uh, uh, compiled version of the uh, uh, of, of their assemblies, right? So. Um, 
uh, you will not be able to leverage any any cache, for example, between between the different websites made uh, made in Blazor. So it's kind of a um, uh, something that not necessarily would re result in speeding up the load times. Moreover, you cannot debug it, or you cannot have some yeah. useful stack information, for example. Right. All right, let's take uh, another quick one. I think uh, can you integrate Blazor with? Uh, I think with an uh, legacy .NET uh, application, so not uh, .NET Core. Uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of uh, using some libraries, the answer is yes, but it should be done using .NET standard or ported to .NET Core pro uh, .NET Core uh, application. Um, I think he's referring to hosting uh, Blazor host into an, a web application. Ah, okay. Yeah. It can be hosted uh, in every web server in, and also in, in, into Ethernet framework application because it's just a, it's, it's an HTML page, so uh, can be uh, provided by also from an SPX or or an MVC page, right, Marco? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, if the question is, uh, can I host it in a in a .NET web app? Definitely, yes. Um, so you just need uh, your, let's say, MVC 1.1.0 .NET framework <laughs> page to to return the uh, to return the the proper tag, which is uh, interpreted by Blazor, and then there's a JavaScript that starts up the entire thing. So uh, yeah. you can definitely do it. Um, in terms of sharing the code, uh, Blazor supports .NET standard. But obviously, this means that the, the, the code must be compiled, uh, must be compliant with .NET standards. So if you have a very, very legacy application, you need to, uh, to make sure of this. So probably in that case, I would rely on uh, uh, HTTP calls in that case. You cannot use Windows Form or WPS yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or .NET, of, of, yeah. of course. Uh, all right. Uh, well. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, yeah, we're out of time, but uh, there is one more question about uh, debugging. So if you can please uh, answer it uh, in the chat. And yeah, thank you again, both of you. Um, and yeah, looking forward to having you in CodeCamp uh, next time.